We've got them. Well, good evening and, or good afternoon where you are and welcome to the Circus Historical Society's 11th Circus History Live program. And we've got a very special program tonight. In fact, this is our first straw house. We sold out all of our seats. And without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to our host, Chris Berry. Thanks, Bruce. And again, welcome to another edition of Circus History Live. This is our opportunity to talk about issues that are really of interest to people who love the circus as we do. And uh, being the fact that this is being recorded in February of 2022, this is Black History Month. And we wanted to take an opportunity to celebrate the importance of African-Americans and, and Black performers, managers, and others in the American circus. So that's exactly what we're doing today. And before we get started, I just kind of want to talk a little bit about the history of African-Americans in the circus. Uh, you know, there have actually, from the very beginning, there have been African-Americans involved in some aspect of the circus, but it really wasn't until the second half of the 20th century and even later when we saw people who were in more of a prominent position of performing and more of a prominent position of management uh, in, in the American circuses. Having said that, there are a couple of people that I want to point out before we get going here, and probably one of the first was an elephant trainer by the name of Ephraim Thompson. Ephraim Thompson uh, worked for the Adam Forpaw Circus out of Philadelphia, training elephants back uh, in the late part of the 19th century. But because he was African-American, he could not present the elephants himself. So what did he do? He acquired three elephants and he went to Europe where he became a sensation. And if you can see this poster, This is a poster for the Folly Brigade in France. You can see here is it is three elephants. He was a sensation in Europe around 1900 and late 1800s, but he was unable to perform in the United States. Another person I wanted to point out was P.G. Lowry. P.G. Lowry was a very highly trained Boston Conservatory trumpet player. Uh, and he became the sideshow leader for the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Band in the 1920s. Keep in mind, at that time, the circus was a uniting part of the United States. It was something that came, you saw the same thing in Columbus, Ohio, that you saw in Fresno, California. And P.G. Lowry should be noted as being one of the first who brought what became, later became known as jazz across the United States. So African Americans have long had a very important role in American circus. And today, we are very pleased to present you with th four of the, those people who have been very prominent uh, in the late 19, 1900s, uh, 1990s, and the early 2000s. I want to start off with Denise Payne. Denise, you were one of the very first female black clowns, not the first, but one of the very first on Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. I know you traveled all over the world. You had never really seen uh, things like discrimination because your father was in the military, but tell us about what it was coming to the United States and that first performance where I think you were maybe a ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, in fact, that's how I got in uh, to the business. Um, I actually started, I didn't want to be a clown. I never thought about being a clown, never saw a circus. I actually wanted to be um, an actress. And uh, one of the jobs I had in Sacramento, we put on children's shows, for example. And it was at that show where a lady came backstage and said that I had good facial expressions had I ever thought about being a clown. Now, before that, again, I wanted to replace Cicely Tyson. I wanted to be the, you know, a, a dramatic actress. I even eventually studied at Lee Strasberg Theater Institute in New York City. So you add all that together and then put that on top of her, uh, her um, remark that I could be a circus clown, I stopped and it was an insult to me, actually. It was an insult. I don't want to be a stupid clown. That's the first thing that, you know, popped into my head. But as the day went on, she told me about the auditions for a clown college. She knew where they were at the Oakland Coliseum. Again, I was in Sacramento. She knew where they were, but she didn't know when they were. Okay, the day went on at my job. And I uh, kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And at the end of the day, I had worked myself up into a frenzy thinking this would be fantastic. That would be fun, not a career, but just fun. So when I got home that night, I called the Oakland Coliseum and um, they told me that they were two days away. I auditioned in 1977 
But when I um, got home and called them and they told me again that it was two days away, um, I had prepared some things. I had learned how to juggle. This came out of the blue because I didn't know what to do with my life. But years before, when I was um, a teenager, I wanted to learn how to juggle. So I learned how to juggle, ride a unicycle. Few years after that, um, I got a unicycle. No idea why I still wanted to be an actress. This is why I always say that my steps are ordered by the Lord because I didn't know what I wanted to do. He took one look at my face and said, that girl's gonna be a clown. <laughs> so I called and got into, um, found about the auditions. I went, grabbed my younger sister, Adrian, as my moral support, went to the Oakland Coliseum and auditioned uh, later in the last part of the year, 1977. Got accepted, but I got a, a letter from them stating that when I did audition, it was one week too late for the 1977 class. So I got into the 1978 class, went through and got accepted. And uh, Urban Feld at the end of the class put his hands down when we were called into the office one by one, put his hands down on the desk and said, well, Denise, I'm gonna put you to work. Red Unit, welcome to the greatest show on earth. And that began my 25 year career. And Different career, circuses. And what a, what a career it was. Uh, Vanessa, oh, I, I mean, it. Vanessa uh, Thomas Smith, you had kind of an interesting situation because you had no interest in being in a circus. You were a dancer, a ballerina. This is correct, from Philadelphia. I wanted to be a ballerina from age four. And I was definitely more interested in seeing Swan Lake than I was to see the circus. When it came to down, we used to go with my school group. But um, I ended up going to college for dance. Um, I auditioned and became a member of Philodanko. During that time also in the summers, I worked at as, as a kid of the kingdom at Walt Disney World and ended up graduating from college with a dance degree and continued to dance with Philodanko. But you're only as good as your next gig. That's what happens in the entertainment business. So I would be auditioning for lots of things. I was always auditioning to be some sort of a musical theater person and couldn't sing a lick. But boy, could I dance. I felt like I could dance. And I had seen dancers go, I would check backstage. I'd take auditions in New York, um, but I really wasn't looking for a job. And, but, always auditioning. So in Philly, I saw that they had a clown, a clown audition, Denise. And I went to the clown audition. I took, I took one of the dancers with me for backup. I took the audition. It was on a Thursday. And as fate would have it, they said that I was actually a very good candidate for clown college. Okay. Wow. My father was a police officer in Philadelphia and uh, did not <laughs> understand what a clown college would be. He just spent all this money for me to go to a college that wasn't for clowns. And so he was like, nah, what is she talking? Anyway, that was on a Thursday. On the way out, I proceeded to tell them that I did not want to be a clown. But I knew there were dancers on the show and, a, and, a, and the dance captain walked in at that time. And she gave me an impromptu dance audition for you know two, three minutes. And she said, thank you very much. We have your information from the clown care, clown care, clown college people. And um, so that was on my way. Thursday, Saturday morning, they called me and said, hi, we have an opening position for you as a showgirl with Mingling Brothers. That was two days later, Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning. And if you'd like to go with us, you could jump on the train and go to Oklahoma. I was like, this is going too fast for me. I was in a professional dance class. I was going to have to tell my boss there um, that I was going to be leaving. But I, but I really talked to my mom and dad um, about it. My mom was like, yeah, go ahead, try it. You always wanted to go to the Pacific Ocean. Maybe it looks different because somehow I thought. West Coast looked different than the East Coast water. 
my father was like, oh no, what are you doing? You can't do that. I mean, I'm saying it kind of quietly. That's not what he really said. But I, I went and talked to um, the director of Philodanko, explained it to her. I had to teach some of my parts because we were getting ready to dance in New York big time. And so I had to teach someone my parts. Someone um, had just had recently left. Um, and I think I got the position because I was the last person that they had auditioned because they had had a big audition at Madison Square Garden and they had auditioned like 200 women. So a week later, I get on and I fly and I land in Tucson, Arizona. And the rest is my circus history because who taught me aerial work? Antoinette Cancelo. And, I, and then I knew there was something kindred there because that's my middle name. And when she said Antoinette Cancelo, I said, I'm, you know, I'm Antoinette. So I did that. And from there, Mr. Vargas saw me and I was hired as a, one of the first group of Vargettes at Circus Vargas in 1980. And, and that gonna, is the rest of history. And we're going to get into the uh, discussion of uh, Big Apple, where you became yes. um, the first Black female ringmaster also. Uh, and speaking of ringmasters, uh, if you were dancing, Jonathan Lee Iverson, who I think you're muted right now, uh, you were singing. And uh, yes. how did that all come about? Yeah, I had plans of my own, uh, like everybody. Uh, my, myself and Vanessa, it's determined the, the mythology of people running away from the circus is just that uh, no one runs away to join the circus. Somehow it pulls you in um, despite your plans, despite whatever you have going on. I was, uh, as many people know, I was with the world famous boys choir of Harlem uh, in my teen years, greatest teen years one could ever have. Um, I went to the LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts. So I was inundated with music, music, song, traveling, um, performing, being in front of some extraordinary people in my young life, uh, visiting places like the White House quite often. The best pancakes I've ever had, by the way, <laughs> best pancakes and bacon in the White House. And I remember because the cook there, she was so happy to see us. Oh, you boys, we're going to take care of you. That's what she said. And she did. And it was great. I think that was that was Bush one's uh, administration. God bless him. God rest his soul. Anyway, I went to the Hart School of Music, um, and that was a lovely experience. And uh, I was under the uh, uh, the uh, instruction of a fantastic uh, tenor by the name of Jerome Pruitt, who has uh, really had a really great career in Europe. In fact, my first year there, he. <laughs> I didn't even see him. I barely saw him. And he let me know because he was still working, which I liked. I, I only wanted to work with people who were actually doing what I wanted to do. And uh, if you want to know who Jerome Pruitt is, there's a movie called The Music Teacher, I believe. And he does the voiceover for the dueling singers. So anyway, um, I studied under him and went the four years, graduated. And I met another teacher. He and I clicked very well. And the plan was to just go to Europe and just stay there and work and work and grow. Because, you know, opera, much like ballet and, and you know, a lot of the performing arts or anything, really, you know, the thing, no matter how talented you are, you know, your body has to grow uh, into those, those fields. And so um, I was no exception. So naturally, I went out and auditioned for whatever I could so I could raise some funds. And um, <laughs> I happened into this audition for the Fireside Dinner Theater Christmas show. Fireside Dinner Theater is out there in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. I was being auditioned in uh, NOLA Studios in New York by uh, the great uh, Philip William McKinley, who unbeknownst to me was also auditioning uh, for, <laughs> for the Ringley Brothers show. I didn't know that until I got a call later that evening. Um, they said, yes, uh, let's, we, we want you for the fireside. Uh, congratulations. What would you think about uh, auditioning for Ringmaster, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey? And I was like, 
honestly, all I could think of was that's a great pickup line. I could use it was 22. I was like, man, that'd be a great pickup line. To go up to someone. Yeah, sure. Why not? And um, of course, it was a rigorous audition process. I was up against about 30 others, some of whom I met during my, <laughs> during my career. And they always go, you know, I auditioned for that role, too. Well, you did good, though. Congratulations. Thanks. And um, it was great. I auditioned. Uh, they they taped me for uh, Mr. Feld. I said, you know, come in, do the whole ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages. I did that speech. I, I sang a song and they were really uh, adamant about that. They were really adamant about the fact that they wanted a singing ringmaster. And I, I mean, I had no clue. I was completely ignorant of circus culture. And save for whatever I saw at Madison Square Garden growing up as a kid, it was just big, wondrous thing to me. I, I never had any uh, I'd never looked down on it or anything. I just thought they were otherworldly. You know, I just thought it was it was like, you know, going to do then what was WWF, you know, and seeing Andre the Giant. That's what it was just pure, great entertainment. And, um, you know, to find out that they had a great dynamic musical legacy was wow, was um, something that really aligned with what I wanted to do. And uh, they weren't lying. So uh, eventually I met uh, the late, great Tim Holst, who I auditioned for in Wisconsin. And um, on the spot, we had a conversation and, you know, essentially the rest was history. And I ventured into a really wondrous life that was supposed to only be like most of the folks here. It was supposed to be a year, it was supposed to be a year. I'd have some stories to tell, you know, call my friend Jay, you know, that acrobat, you know, have all these weird stories I was going to tell. But um, who knew it was going to turn into a, a, almost a 20 year odyssey. Um, and I, I say this all the time. You, you know, I just closed a wonderful show uh, in Winter Park uh, uh, mm -hmm. at the Winter Park Playhouse. It's a beautiful show called Travel in the 1930s, a Harlem musical romance. And I was hanging out with the cast, beautiful cast, so much talent. And I come to find out one of the cast members says, I, I think I know you. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I called my mother. I said, who was that guy who came to speak at my school? <laughs> who, who was that guy? <laughs> and she yeah. shows me this text. She said, it's you. My mother said, his name was Jonathan Lee Iverson. So I spoke at her school or something when I was traveling with the show. And I mean, what a full circle moment for me. But it was really wonderful. So, yeah. You know, I, I mean, this this great and wonderful thing called the circus, I, I would say ringmaster of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey is without a shadow of a doubt, the greatest gig in show business. I, I think it was the greatest gig in show business. I enjoyed every moment of it. Even when I thought I wasn't, I, I enjoyed every moment of it. So when you were growing up in New York City, when you were going to Madison Square Garden, there was a kid by the name of uh, Kip Jones who was growing up in the Bronx and Kip, at that point, you already knew about the King Charles troupe, I guess, didn't you? Yeah, that indeed. Yeah, so I uh, happened to uh, grow up as a second generation uh, rider of King Charles troupe. I uh, entered, well, I was introduced to the troupe when I was uh, at the age of 14, in about 1978, I want to say. Um, and how I actually came across the troupe was uh, one, one afternoon after school, I just happened to be, you know, hanging out with a good buddy of mine in the neighborhood. And uh, he had just mentioned to me that he was, uh, you know, planning to go uh, try out for some sports team. So I said, um, you know, I'll tag along with you and just, you know, go and check it out. You know, I'm thinking, you know, basketball, football, baseball, you know, uh, a, a typical, you know, sports team tryout. Uh, but then I walked into this gymnasium with over, you know, 15, 20 guys doing these unimaginable things on unicycles. Uh, and to top it, uh, to top uh, that, they were doing it uh, while playing basketball. So that's how I kind of fell in love uh, with the uh, the whole concept of unicycle basketball. Um, and then, then from there, I you know it just became a, a passion for me uh, over the years to learn about the troops' history, about how they first auditioned on the sidewalks of Madison Square Garden in uh, on April fourteenth, nineteen sixty eight, which was actually ten days after the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, and they performed, uh, well, performed they auditioned for uh, Irvin Feld and uh, Trolley Rodin. Uh, 
And, mm. uh, uh, and and Bill Minson was actually uh, the troops' first business manager, and he was very instrumental in uh, making that connection with Ringling Brothers and the troop. Uh, and then Bill got the uh, call, you know, the next following year uh, from uh, Tro uh, Trolley Rodin that uh, you know we did it. You know, the troop uh, is going to be the next you know all black uh, circus troop to perform. Uh, in the history of uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, uh, in its 99-year history, uh, so that that's definitely uh, uh, an amazement and um, very um, proud to uh, be a part of this uh, this legacy. You know, uh, Kip, uh, you and uh, Denise and Vanessa all mentioned Irvin Feld, uh, Jonathan. Uh, you mentioned Tim Holst, and of course Kenneth Feld, who you worked closely with. Um, the Felds had this long relationship with the African-American community. Uh, some of the people on this call may know this already, but when they started their drugstore uh, in Washington, DC, the NAACP actually uh, helped them start that drugstore with the understanding that there would be a pharmacist there who could provide uh, pharmaceuticals to the African-American community. I don't know how many people knew that. Wow. But that was actually the impetus of that super, super uh, discount drugstore, which of course then went on to uh, sell records, uh, right. produce concerts and uh, ultimately purchase uh, the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus and operate it for so many years. So there was a, sort of an inclusiveness, I think, of the Feld family from the very beginning. And Irvin Feld and Alan Bloom would frequently say, you know, the circus is for the masses, not for the classes. So Jonathan, when you talk about uh, the going to that school, I mean, you were kind of a role model for uh, other young African-Americans, I would assume. That's what I've been told. Um, that's always been one of the great, uh, I guess, one of the great adventures of doing what I did. And I'm sure Vanessa's experienced the same thing as well as Kip and as well as Denise and so many of us who've, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I just had a wonderful conversation with Vanessa on Circus Voices podcast, and she <laughs> spoke of how you know, so many times she's always meeting people who go, I I've never heard about anybody black in the circus. Well, now I know you, you know, <laughs> and it it's funny. Um, I would get this all the time. And, and I have to tell you, I wrestled with it in the beginning. It was actually Barbara Flukout, who um, was the head of our national PR, absolute genius, taught me everything about PR, <laughs> helped keep my foot out my mouth a lot. And um she was the one who really, really, um, and it's strange, she's, you know, she's a Jewish woman. And she was like, look, she said, believe me, this is something that really, really matters for you. I understood it historically. I was not blind to that at all. I grew up in the Boys Choir of Harlem. My mother's an activist. I come from a family of activists. I understood the significance of it. Um, I think I was in the mindset of I didn't want to be pigeonholed by it. Um, I really, really because, you know, you work very hard. You want people to come and look at your work and, and hear you for what you do, which is the whole point of uh, uh, equality movements. And um, it, it really dawned on me, you know, what rep, how representation matters when my grandfather uh, came to the show, you know, and there's nothing like seeing your grandparents, these people you held in great reverence, turn into six-year-olds. You know, and, and that's the magic of a circus. But my grandfather was at the at uh, the Ringling Brothers show with my grandmother in Chicago, Illinois, where my uncle, my late uncle, lived. And uh, so it was a family affair. And after the show, you know, he's just over the moon. I get my voice from my grandfather, from that side of the family. Uh, you know, legend has it he was a, an extraordinary singer. He was of that uh, era of great male quartet gospel quartets and you know those guys were singing and um <laughs> and he's sitting there in the arena and he's just you know he's just you know he's all about his grandson and he tells me he goes my goodness he said you know i want you to know he said i just i mean he's just he loves his show of course and he says he stops for a second and goes you know there was time i couldn't sit here he mm -hmm. said i couldn't sit here and here's my grandson. And then that was it. And that hit me like I said, okay, so I get it, <laughs> you know? And that was very impactful to me, knowing his history, knowing what he, he went through. Um, you know, he escaped a lynching. 
because he was trying to unionize um, workers and things of that nature. So I really understood it from then. And, and from that point, I was able to appreciate, you know, uh, children of all ages, so to speak, who would approach me a lot, some of their parents, I would meet, you know, um, people who adopted black children, and they would say, you know, my goodness, I, I wanted so bad for our child to see someone that reflected them. And, you know, he said, you won't believe it. I remember I was in California and it was this couple and they had a, a black daughter and they were like, she was just, she just couldn't stop. She said, he's brown like me, he's brown like me, you know? And so yeah. I really understood just being present, what that meant. Um, and even though that could be, it, it had some pressure to it. I, I chose to make it a really good burden for me, you know, because I, I really understood, man, it does mean something for people to see themselves reflected in such a wonderful position because, you know, being ringmaster, I mean, that's something, you know, they were seeing me, they understood nothing happened until I said so, you know, and, and for children of all ages and really of all backgrounds to see that that's a really powerful thing. And so, um, it grew on me and it grew rather quickly, but I'm, I'm glad, you know, I, I had some wise people around me to really help me really appreciate what that meant to, to, to be a face, a role model for others. So Kip, uh, you know, you, obviously you weren't part of that first group of the King Charles troop, but you, you knew a lot of those guys, they were real groundbreakers. I mean, they were, you know, coming in and I'm sure that they, were faced with probably a lot of uh, discrimination that they might not have seen growing up in the South Bronx. Yeah, that, uh, that's true, Chris. Uh, from um, a lot of the stories that have been uh, told to me, um, you know, it was the great Ringling Brothers, a traditional European circus, integrating kids from the inner city into the center ring for the first time, you know? So it was that whole um, hurdle of getting over that I think the guys uh, must have uh, experienced uh, when, you know, coming out of, uh, you know, the Bronx and being uh, put into the center ring uh, of Ringling Brothers and Bonham and Belly Circus. Yeah, and Denise, uh, and by the way, I wanna point out, I see her on the call here. Bernice Collins is also on the call. Hi, Bernice. Uh, Bernice was actually the very first uh, black African-American clown on Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey in 1977, another trailblazer. So it's great to see you, Bernice, on the call here also. Thank you. It's so happy to see everybody. <laughs> yeah. it's, um, so, so, you know, kind of bring you into the discussion with Denise here. So as clowns, you know, you, you obviously wear makeup, but you also can relate to the children a little bit differently also than maybe an adult performer could. So first that, with you, yeah, yeah. Denise. That, it's like one of those things, it's the same thing that Jonathan was saying, you find yourself uh, in a position where you are a role model for, for children and for others. And you have, and we have, a responsibility goes along with that. And you have to realize that and people helped you realize that and helped you do something with that. Uh, well, he mentioned Barbara Flukhaus. She was one of my mentors as well. And Alan Bloom, I called him Daddy Bloom because he really took a lot of us under wing and the King Charles troop took me under wing and guided me through just being a part of that life and what to do with it. I mean, I wanted to do it as a child anyway, but once you get into it, people have to show you how to live it and what to do with it once you have it and how to thrive in it and enjoy it at the same time. And it has been an incredible journey and an incredible life. And, and it's, so, it's so wonderful to be a part of this family. That and is. I know Denise shares a lot of those same uh, things because you basically had the same job. You were clowns, you did, you did it a little differently, but Denise, when you look back on you know, some of those, um, you, know, you put on the makeup kind of for the first time, you're down there, uh, you're talking to these kids, you're, you're acting it out. I mean, how did that feel? I'm going to tell a little very brief story of, and that will sum that up. First of all, I grew up um, on the, in Air Force bases. My father was an original Tuskegee Airman during World War II. So I have that background to go with. With through my journey as of being a clown, I went from that to the sawed ring, uh, to sawdust ring 
which carried me into uh, Europe with Jerry Cottle's circus. Now, so far as relating to black kids, black kids relating to me, when I was growing up, um, I was always the own, basically the only child of color in the schools. And when I, uh, when we were stationed in England, I was the only one of color. I started school over there. I developed a British accent. I learned to speak over there, actually. <laughs> and um, I started in my school. My first school was actually a one-room schoolhouse, a primary schoolhouse. And we had little um, uh, things in so far as in the um, uh, big halls in these schools. And we'd always bring all the kids in. All of us would come in and we'd sit on the floor to listen to the speaker or to the performer or whoever was there. Now, on Jerry Cottle's Circus, to give you an idea of how the relationship is between um, Black kids to me as a clown, me to Black kids, on one of the school shows that I did, I did six sh school shows a day, every day for Jerry Cottle's Circus. One of the shows that we did, I was setting my things up at the front of the room and the kids were coming in, their eyes were all aglow and they were looking at Baby D. I took my character, Baby D. They were watching Baby D set up and when I turned around, all these beautiful little British kids were sitting there wide-eyed waiting. One child was black and she goes, baby D, baby D. And she motioned for me to come over. So I went over to her and I bent down and I said, yes. She goes, I'm brown too. That explains the whole relationship between being an African-American performer, African-American clown, to an uh, African-American child. The relationship, the recognition that uh, they have for you, it, it's incredible because we are so few in, uh, in number in the, in the cert world of the circus that one person can make a difference. It, it's incredible. It's incredible. I know, Vanessa, I know you told me uh, a story once about going to the ballet as a child mm -hmm. and the same thing. When you saw that black ballerina, none of the other ballerinas counted. Nope. I was just like in, in the crossover that I was, I, I, would, I saw uh, the, a black ballerina in the core and probably just like the rest of the audience that was predominantly white, we were all watching that black ballerina. Me from the perspective that I knew how hard she had trained to get into that position for them to even treat her as equal. And, and, the, and probably the other portion of the audience was looking at her and part of them were thinking, well, how did she get in there? How did, how did she get in there? So all of a sudden, all eyes were on her. The target is on her. And for all of us speaking, I think, you know, we did find ourselves quite often as the only, not only the only person of color in the circus, sometimes you were the only person of color in a totally different environment. You know, you were, you, you got to be comfortable in the circus, but then you had to go out and do speaking gigs behalf of the circus. You had to go to receptions. You went to Rotary Club events. And, and the expectation was, you know, I, my, one of the stories I have is that it wasn't the kids. The kids were ve always very embraceable, mm -hmm. I felt. But I was doing an interview and I had a reporter that continually asked me what country I was from. Ah. And I said, West Philly, does that count as a country? And they were like, ah. And they said, no, really, where are you from? Are you from like Ethiopia? And this was not, not, 1980s, 1990s. And I, I knew about circus and the connotation and not so much the circus, but sideshows um, at the turn of the century. And folks, they were all basically, a lot of them were American, but they, the exoticism that they needed for them to pay, for them to come to the sideshow, you had to be from somewhere else. And mm -hmm. I really like went back and went, Did, do they really think that I'm from another country? I'm just like them, I'm from America. Why, why, 
Why do I have to be from another country? Barnum, Barnum had what he called the Ethnological Congress, which was supposedly people from all over the world. And probably a lot of them were Americans. Before we move on, and I've got, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Vanessa, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you talked about that being from another country, it reminded me, I mean, of the people who are on the panel here, you have probably done more different jobs in the circus. You've done everything from, you know, aerial ballet to selling snow cones, you know? I mean, you've you've been a ringmaster and you've worked with uh, the famous elephant, Anna Mae and the Big Apple yeah. Circus. Yeah. So, so um, what, what was sort of a defining moment in your career where you sort of thought, you know what, this is, I got to do this for the rest of my life, or I've got to, you know, this is my career, this is my calling. I, I met I met a lot of people while at my, the brief time that I was on Ringling, because uh, Mr. Clifford Vargas saw me on the Ringling show and asked if I wanted to join his show. So I did. Once again, I'm in California, and I'm looking at the Pacific Ocean going, all right, all right, a year, okay, I'm going to go back and finish my master's degree or whatever. And um, it was on that show that I was given the opportunity to just, just come out of the box that I didn't even know I was in because I was asked, I remember Mr. Vargas saying, oh, Vanessa, we wanna do three rings of dogs and do you have a dog or have you ever done, you have a, do you wanna do a dog act? I was like, I don't know. He was like, well, we're going to get the dogs and we're going to teach you how to train the dogs and do the dogs. Oh, okay. So I did that. Then it was like, did you, were you ever in a magic act? I'm like, no. Okay. Well, we're going to teach you to get in the box. They're going to put swords in, in there on you, but don't worry about it. You know, and you're just going to pop out of the box and go ta-da. Can you do that? Okay. Let me think about that. All right. Maybe I can do that. Did you ride elephants? Mm, I hemmed and hawed because... I actually had told them that I rode on Ringling, but I hadn't, Shh, don't tell anybody. So when I got there and Rex Williams asked me, had I been on an elephant, I had nightmares about it because I didn't know how to mount. I didn't know how to get on the elephant. I had to step on anything like that. And so I ended up being featured with Rex Williams and in the center ring with him and his daughters and his wife. Um, at Circus Vargas for those four years. And it was absolutely amazing. To this day, he gave me my nickname, which became my CB handle while I was driving, Spider Darling. He said, because when you were riding, you look just like a spider because he had me on one elephant to jump to another elephant. And then while I was practicing that, the elephant separated. So I was like in a split. I thought I was like, I didn't, I didn't bargain for this. What is that? But anyway, I didn't fall. So after that, he said, that's it, spider. You're my <laughs> spider darling. And anybody on the call, they know. If they're on Vargas, that was my name. So a lot of people didn't even know my name was Vanessa. Because Rex <laughs> had given me my nickname, and I was spider. So I, then I learned how to, I just learned how to do amazing things for four years. And then, um, I ended up deciding that that was enough time. My parents had come to see me. My dad had come to see me. Um, and I was actually very, very proud of that. And he, at one point, he just never said, you know, that he thought that I had made the right decision. He couldn't say that. But when I'd come home to visit, I would stop by the precinct that he worked out of. And um, he, Usually he wasn't there, he was a detective by then. And I'd go in to see if he was there. And the best like turning point for me was when his colleagues at the job said, oh, I know who you are. You're Ed Thomas's daughter. He said, your dad collects everything that you send to him and he brings it in here and he shows it to us and he tells us, how proud he is of his daughter. And I was like- Fantastic. Yes, yes. So yes. Jonathan, when you, uh, you know, whereas Vanessa had all these different jobs, for you, from the moment the show starts to the moment the show ends, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey for, you know, 20 plus years, 
you were the guy. I mean, you performed from start to finish. That meant that you were literally in the spotlight the entire time. That must have been a lot of pressure. No, you know what? I mean, it fit my ego. <laughs> and I realized I, it's funny because I, I, I often tell people God is a prankster, you know, because <laughs> you, you have your plans, you have your things going. And when I really came to appreciate what Ringling Brothers was for me and what the circus was for me, um, and, you know, the, all these little signs were dropping there, right? You know, I met the wonderful John Fugate, um, among other different ringmasters who were very supportive and very kind. Uh, Jimmy James Plot, I remember he came with a wonderful canister of cookies, and he gave me a bit of advice. He said, look, just you look him in the eye and you, you tell him what you want. I was like, okay. Um, and, and John Fugate, I'll never forget, he, he signed his card and he told me, once the sawdust gets in your veins, you'll never be the same. And um, I really, you know, I, that was my first year. So I'm like, who's this old man? Who does he think he's talking about? But boy, was he right. Because years later, I'm like, man, it's true. And I saw the trajectory of my life from being a choir boy and how that set me up perfectly for this job. Because when I was growing up, it was drilled into me that you're an ambassador, you represent your people, you represent the Harlem community, you represent your family. I mean, we went through, when we would travel with the Boys Choir of Harlem, we would actually have cultural ambassadors from the uh, different countries that we would go to that would come in and they would show us certain customary things we would, the do's and don'ts going into these countries. Um, my <laughs> choir director was a formidable man I don't think he would fare well in this day and age. Um, he would tell us often, listen, if we go in this hotel and we get kicked out, you're not going to make it home to your parents, things like that. Um, but we understood the necessity of ambassadorships. One of the things we would do after a concert is we would go out into the uh, foyer or into the lobby of the, the, the concert hall and we would greet the audience. And that was a part of our whole learning how to be ambassadors, to present ourselves, how to really relate to people and talk to them and all of those things. So all of that set me up, you know, all of that travel, being around so many different people, being in different environments, just as a kid, which I was just having great time doing and enjoying the fact that I, you know, I, I learned very early to work hard for something. And I never knew that was setting me up for, in my opinion, the ultimate ambassadorship as ringmaster, the mouthpiece of an American icon. And I re remember realizing, wow, I'm actually perfectly placed. And I don't mean that as like a, you know, to, to, to blow my own horn, but it was like, oh my goodness, you know, I don't think anybody can prepare themselves for circus, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Cause when I first started, I felt like, it felt like they just threw me in the ocean <laughs> and said, all right, make it, you know? And I felt that way, but all of a sudden I started calling on these different things that just were there and embedded in me that I didn't realize because I was just doing it and realizing that that's what made it really much easier to handle the spotlight. And also, again, having those wonderful people who kind of stepped in, who were sort of angels who, you know, would phone in, you know, like a barber flu cow to really, really just taught me how to manage myself <laughs> in the press. And I, I can't emphasize that uh, anymore because I, I mean, like, I don't think people realize how important the science of media is, no. you know, just to know what to say and what not to say. It, 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 it just was a grand thing for me. And those early uh, lessons on being ambassador paid off well, because for many years, you were the face of Ringling Brothers and mm -hmm. Barnum and Bailey. Um, I, we're going to go on. We have a lot of ground to cover still. I want to, uh, again, welcome uh, everyone to this meeting of the Circus Historical Society's Circus History Live. We do this every month. I hope you'll be able to join us again in the future. Uh, and I hope you will consider joining the Circus Historical Society. You can get more information at circushistory.org. Uh, we have our bandwagon uh, quarterly magazine, which uh, takes a look at all kinds of circus history, uh, mostly in the United States, but really worldwide. Uh, Denise, when you you talked a little bit about joining on as a as a clown, at what point did you actually know that you were sort of accepted and you you know you were part of the club? 
Good question. Not right away, because like I said, I never thought about being a clown and never con I never considered it, never saw a circus. Got into clown college by um, uh, being that dummy in that ventriloquist act that uh, the lady saw. When I got into clown college, went through the eight weeks, I started to, it started to put a little tingle in my spirit a little bit there because I kept saying, this ought to be fun. This is going to be fun. That's the key word, fun. I never thought of it as a career until opening night of the Red Unit, my first year on uh, the show. We were all lined up. The lights were all completely dark. Kit Haskett was our ringmaster at the time. And he, <clears throat> he was out in the, the, on the track. Everybody else was standing behind the blue curtain, our famous blue curtain. I was waiting in line. All of us, seven first of Mays, all gathered in a circle, hugged each other and said, well, this is it. And then the whistle blew, we came out and we went to our spot. My spot was on one of the tiger um, stands in ring two, still in the dark. As I stood there, I'm still thinking, you know, I'll do this for maybe like a year and then I'll go back to Broadway and be a Broadway star. <laughs> but so I'm standing up there on my tiger stand, looking around and it completely dark and all the trinkets that the kids were waving, the lights were shining like stars in the sky. The spotlight came up on Kit and he said, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, producers Irvin Feld and Kenneth Feld, welcome you to the 109th edition of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, the greatest <laughs> show on earth. And the lights came on, our arms went up uh, and on our sides in style. When the lights came up, full house, everybody in the audience stood up. It was right then and there. I knew I had found my corner of the sky. Mm -hmm. Never That's looked back. 25 years later, five different shows, Universe Soul, Big Top Circus, Jerry Cottle Circus, where I was the first black woman clown to perform in Europe, LA Circus, great show, George Corona show, all of those in 25 years. And it's quite an experience. And it's, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Hi, Peggy. Uh -oh. Peggy was my in my first alley. She taught me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy Williams there too, another one of the uh, pioneer uh, female clowns on the Ringling Circus. Uh, so Kip, I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, you, you grow up in um, the Bronx in an area that is primarily African-American, um, but now you're out there, you know, traveling with uh, a lot of people, people from uh, foreign countries and things like that. Um, I think that there are a certain amount of biases, there's a certain amount of discrimination that probably exists anywhere. But tell me a little bit about how uh, that existed on the circus and how you responded to that. Yeah, so from my uh, experiences when I was on the team, uh, it primarily came from you know cast members and crew. Um, and I think that all stems from uh, them not knowing you know, who you are as, as an individual or as either as a group. Um, and, and the way uh, these barriers, you know, were kind of broken down is that, you know, we'd be able to create, you know, bonds and friendships uh, with, one, with one another, even though that, uh, you know, the performers, uh, a lot of them didn't speak English, but there were certain, you know, head signals and hi brother, hi sister, you would say to each other, and you knew that was, you know, the beginning of uh, moving towards each one another to, you know, to get to know each other uh, uh, as people and as performers. And Jonathan, I know, you know, you and I have talked about that a little bit too. Um, here you were in a very high position of prominence, especially as a kid, basically, going into this. Uh, there must have been some people who were scratching their heads about that. Well, you know, what's funny is um, I, I got them from the very beginning. So Phil McKinley was kind of a genius. I don't know if he knew that. I'll, I'll, I love blowing smoke up pills, but I, he, he, he actually had me sing like right away. Top when I got there. So he had me do it right away. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole thing. And so when I finished, I got this rousing round of applause. And as we know, the one thing in circus, which I have to say to its credit is, when you're when they realize you're capable of doing what you do 
and doing it well, it, it, it just puts you in another, it's like, okay, hey, what, it doesn't matter what they think or feel. It's like, this person is dependable. So it was clear that I could do the job and I was qualified for it. Um, I will say, <laughs> you know, as far as, I, look, I grew up in an activist home. So I have a very perceptive eye and ear. And what I realized was my, my position and the prominence of it was sort of a covering for me, to be quite frank. And so I actually gauged people's um, genuineness <laughs> with folks who look like me on how they treated the guy who was maybe um, mm -hmm. uh, on the crew. Mm -hmm. That's how I knew what you were really like. Because people were careful with me. I had Kenneth Fell on speed dial. So they were real careful with me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I would watch and I would see and I would just how people's behavior would be because I mean and again I don't want to blow my own horn but I'm pretty likable anyway you know I'm tall dark and handsome and I sing pretty it's hard not to like them. you know what I mean so I wasn't I and I had enough uh of yeah I came from a New York and Kip knows like we came from a New York where once upon a time the backdrop was wasn't very pleasant so you know we're not like you know you're not gonna make me wilt over because, you know, you say something or you, you feel a certain kind of way. Um, it, it, I, for, for me, it was, um, I, I understood my position. I understood where I was and I understood how to use it if I needed to. And I would um, when there would be, when they would have, uh, you know, let's say when they hired Andre McLean and he came to my unit immediately, I took him under my wing. Um, and I would do that with other um, African-Americans they would hire quite often because I wanted them to feel like they had a community, they had a covering mm. and a protection because I knew they would be treated differently than myself. You know, I mean, if, if they didn't have that and I wanted others to see, listen, if you cross them, you're crossing me and we're going to have a problem. So I used it to my advantage. Um, and I think what was most important to me, most important, what I learned very quickly um, and other ringmasters sort of taught me this, is that my role didn't stop in the performance. It was because circus is a lifestyle, it's a society. Mm -hmm. So it's how I conducted myself behind the curtain, how I was, all those things. And so I think that garnered me a lot of respect. Um, you know, people understood there were things I just wouldn't involve myself in. And, you know, you can't really mount an argument against someone's character and against how they deliver, you know, how they stand and deliver. And so I think I did that as best I could. Um, you know, I had a couple of run-ins, but I mean, I remember, <laughs> I remember I would hear these things, and th but then I would look at the person who was saying, it was like, I mean, like, I really, and I hate to sound like, I was like, you're so beneath me. Like, what would I do? <laughs> You know, that's so, how I thought of it. It's like, you're so beneath me. Like, I'm going to come down there with you. Really? <laughs> You'll be fired tomorrow anyway. You know what I mean? So I, I, I just didn't allow it to fester on me. But I would stand up for the guy who looked like me or the woman who looked like me or just people who were othered. Um, you know, I would have, there were women who would approach me about certain men in the show not being... Uh, and we all know like circus is very liberal and very flirtatious, whatever. But I think for the most part, we understood what lines not to cross. And some would get kind of, you know, we cross those lines and, you know, I would defend them, you know. So I, 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 I went to use my position as much as I could um, to cover others if, if that was the case. So um, if, by the way, if you have any questions, we're kind of rounding third and headed towards home right now. Uh, if you have any questions for uh, anyone on our panel, uh, use your text that, uh, that you have available to you. We'll, uh, we'll try to get those questions out. Vanessa, you, you know, mm -hmm. Jonathan talks about being you know, a hard worker and I know mm -hmm. you were a hard worker too. Mm -hmm. uh, after a career with Ringling, after a career with Circus Vargas, you literally were selling concessions when mm -hmm. uh, Paul Binder kind of pulled you into the, mm -hmm. into the circus ring. Why don't you tell us that story? Cause I think it's great. Yeah, I had, um, 
finished uh, and pretty much had this kind of decided it was just time to come home and, and go back to Philly. I'm definitely a Philly girl. So I always return back to my Philly roots. Yes, I'd see my, my high school class. Some of my high school members are of, of the Philadelphia High School for Girls is on. <laughs> <laughs> They're on Some the of spot. My folks from Temple University are on. At Temple University, I became an Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated member. <laughs> and I look to go back and do that because the circus had been fun. It had been great. I learned a lot of different things. And I went back to um, Philly and um, it was for wow. now, basically. I, I, um, I did. Uh, I started working retail there and um, at a shoe store, um, which was not good because I bought more shoes than I made money for. So when the guy would be unloading the shoes, I would take my size out. And then by the time I had all those shoes on layaway when my paycheck came, I had some shoes, but I had no money to go anywhere in those shoes. I'm just saying. So I'm a still a little bit like that shoe feet. But anyway, I went to um, saw the Big Apple Circus was playing um, in New York City. I went up to see them. Jim and Tisha Tinsman were on the show. Jeff Gordon, Mr. Gordon was on the show and would talk about circular. Um, and life just goes around and you don't know where you're going. But, you know, our God, he has some other plan for you. Jeff Gordon had been my web setter when I was on the ring sh Ringling Show, uh, on the Red Show. So he's the guy that set my web. We got thrown together haphazardly. So he was on Big Apple. So that was like coming back again, coming home. And um, so I loved the show. It just, it felt to me, it had all the elements. It had the music, it had the dancing, it had the theater atmosphere. It was gonna be playing at Lincoln Center. And, I just, it felt like all of my dance that I loved so much was encapsulated and it was one ring. So um, not anything against three ring shows, but you know, like if you're only one performer, you just can't be in everywhere at one point. So I went there with no intentions of doing circus anymore, saw Jimmy and Tisha and said, okay, the shoe stuff's not working so well in Philly. Let me do something here at Big Apple. So I sold concessions. I sold snow cones, basically, with the blue stuff and, you know, pour the stuff on the top. I did 35 cents back then. Yeah. Yes, yes, was a bargain. 35 cents of still the same sugar we're using today. But I, I digress. Um, so anyway... Tisha and Jim were having a baby. Tisha was doing an aerial act. Tisha was one of my friends that had that I had fell in love with, befriended when I was on Ringling. She was a showgirl when I joined. And um, you know, they just took me under and if I wanted to come and be there and hang out. So there was someone in the Big Apple Circus company that was supposed to cover Tisha. Um, doing this aerial act when, when she kind of decided that she no longer was going to be in the air as pregnancy, pregnancy does to you. So um, they were trying to figure out what they were going to do to cover Tisha. So Tisha knew that I had been on Ringley with her and at, Big, and at um, Circus Vargas. So she walks in with me <laughs> to Paul Binder and says to Paul, Vanessa can cover me in this act because we, you know, she's a performer. She was on Vargas and all that. And Paul is, might be on the call, but I talked to him all. He kind of looked at me and went, but that's like the snow cone girl. You know, like how, how can a snow cone girl be, you know, in a show? So anyway, I ended up covering for Tisha. I had this beautiful blue iridescent costume that was hers that became mine. And, but I was still selling concessions. So it would be, I think I flew and did the aerial act. I think it was in the second half. Don't, don't quote me by that. But I had worked intermission. So I would be running 
and wardrobe was there and they would dress me. And literally some days I had my blue gloves on or some days I just had my blue hands on because it was... <laughs> That is it funny. Was the blue snow cone juice that was all still <laughs> over all my hands, but it matched my costume, so it was okay. <laughs> that is funny. After well, uh, got into big. I think after that they thought once again, this you know back to my skill set. I I finally have come to be have comfort in that I was never the performer that did one thing, and nothing against. I was enamored with people who just could juggle their entire life, or they trained, you know, tigers their whole life, or they clowned, they were clowns. I, I appreciated that so much, but I was that, that girl and still am. If you ask me to do something and you think I can do it, I'm gonna try it once or twice. So when I got onto Big Apple Circus, that's where I learned how to throw knives, walk stilts, do marionette work, ride elephants again with the inimitable Barbara and Buckles Woodcock after performing with the inimitable Rex and Ava Williams. Uh, you know, me and the elephants, we were, became <laughs> lifelong friends. And um, I loved all the elephants I worked with. And, and Chris, I just want to say on an aside note, I went on a safari with um, Lisa Dufresne. We were both working um, at Big Apple. And it was at the time when I knew that I was going to, I was featured two years in a row with the Woodcock Elephants. And I really, to Jonathan's point, again, with, with media, I really wanted to speak about what I saw elephants do in the wild, as opposed to what I thought they might, or that there was incorrect information, misinformation, disinformation, about elephants and their care. Um, and so I went on a safari and I saw elephants in the wild up on their hind legs, no one telling them to do that, crawling on their knees, no one telling them to do that, rolling over on their back, no one was telling them to do that. So I felt very comfortable to be, to do an interview um, about the treatment of the animals that I worked with very closely daily. So that was one of the best um, kind of aha moments because really talking with the, with the Andes, that was kind of when I figured that I was living like we're supposed to live with different people and different animals are all on the earth at the same time. We're supposed to be doing this. It's not supposed to be separate. So I just found my place then again at Big Apple Circus and I was there for 12 years. Amazing. I want to, uh, we're, we're starting to wrap it up here and I know that all of you uh, are doing things. Uh, have you been involved with this for decades? All of you have. Denise, you, you also were on so many uh, shows. Tell us a little bit about what you've got, what you've been working on and how we can uh, continue to share uh, some of these stories uh, with you. Okay, thanks for asking. Um, all the paths that I've gone on, all the journeys that I've had, I wrapped them up over a long, long period of time into a memoir that I have entitled Elbows in My Ears, My Life with Little People, Tigers and Wardrobe Trunks. I started the, the book many, many years ago and I'm going to thank someone that's on um, in the little one of the little squares for helping me going because they helped me with a lot of my editing and that was the Fosters, James Foster. I wanna really thank them for helping me with that. And as I continued on my journey with my memoir, my memoir tells um, a lot about how I got into the circus why I got into the circus. It tells about my personality. It tells about the trials, the tribulations, the fun, the heartache that I had, but mostly fun, uh, that I had. And that's why um, I decided to share that whole journey with everybody because it is an incredible life. But I also went through a lot of um, different things that um, a white clown, white woman clown would go through. 
And uh, you'll read about that also and how I dealt with that. For example, in this circus in uh, England, England, um, I was told before when I first got there that England does not accept women clowns. And I was two different things, a black woman clown. I deal with that also what happened because it was something uh, very interesting and eye-opening that happened to me over there on that show. But all of that I wrapped up and everybody will ride the journey with me with their eyes on the words on paper. They will see what I went through and uh, how I wrapped up my life basically. It's not over, thank the Lord. No, it is not. How I wrap it all up in a package called Elbows in My Ears. I don't have a, um, a release date yet, but I will let Bruce Hawley, Chris Berry, I will let them know uh, when the release date is. And I, I, I invite everybody to, um, to buy the book, basically, because uh, the lifestyle that we have all lived from uh, Vanessa to everybody, to Bernice, Peggy, everybody that's been in the show, Jonathan, Kip, all of us that have been in shows you know that it's a it's a great rainbow world and a, uh, that travels a fantastic a fantastic route 66 of the circus that we call the Tanbark Trail and all of that is wrapped up in my book elbows in my ears and I, I it's been a long journey and I'm glad to get this bad boy out there <laughs> and we will keep everybody posted on the uh, release because it sounds like it's going to be great Kip um, you know look at Kip Jones you might not realize this but he is a tremendous athlete and I know for a fact that uh, he was a longtime Knicks fan before he ever even started riding a unicycle but um, it hasn't stopped for you yet either no uh, I you know I, I joke around a lot uh, and say that you know the unicycle uh, is my fountain of youth uh, as, as long as I keep riding to the wheel falls off you know there's <laughs> nothing that it's nothing uh, you know no ceiling that we can't reach so I, I always keep that phrase uh, in my mind as I, I wake up every day. And uh, Vanessa, I mean, you dance has been a part of your life since you were, I probably can't even remember. And you're still so involved, four years old, you're still so involved with the uh, dance scene in Philadelphia. Um, but I know you got sinus in your veins too. Yes, I do. I uh, I do I do t dance now. I teach dance. Um, I'm a certified Zumba instructor, and I teach twice a week, along with a ballet class as well, because that's where it all started. I just loved dance, and particularly ballet. Um, I have found myself um, currently as a business manager for an accounting firm. Your part time controller. I've been there now for 11 years. And um, with that, I get to, we get to work with uh, nonprofits that are national, but currently probably going to be starting some work internationally. So that's just an exceptional growth for the company that I work for. But along with that, we do booking, um, actually accounting work, mostly for nonprofits. And, um, and so with that, I find myself to be able to be on um, some boards, one of which is a, a board for my chapter of my sorority in Philadelphia, um, the Ivy Legacy Foundation. And the other is I sit on a board for a circus um, project in Philadelphia called Circadium. And Circadium is a certificate program for students to come and to train um, to be, I'm gonna use just slightly in, in quotations, professional circus performers, and that they would be able to work anywhere with their skill set, and kind of um, with, with coaches helping them, musicians helping them, um, costumers helping them to create not that they're a juggler, but a full act that could be booked anywhere. So um, there, that email address is circadium.org. I would appreciate it if you would visit either of those and, um, and the dance company, philodanko.org. Those are my hearts and you guys are my heart. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. And Jonathan, before you, uh, you know, kind of give us the final, may all your days, <laughs> uh, I would, I'd like for you to, uh, you know, I mean, 
I got to think if I opened up your closet, there's at least one top hat in there, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a few. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I know you talked a little bit about the uh, the play that you did in Winter Park. You've done a lot of things since um, since the show closed in 2017. Uh, where can we see you and uh, what's what's on the horizon? Well, you can definitely see me this coming weekend at uh, Capitol One Hall in Washington, D.C. with our wonderful uh, new company, uh, Om- Omnium Circus. Yeah, I'm having trouble mm-hmm. saying it, but Omnium Circus. Omnium Circus is a fantastic new uh, contribution to this fantastic thing we love called the circus. We're broadening the tent, as you know, just not just... Um, it's not just the usual suspects, but now we are featuring uh, multi-able performers, and mm-hmm. it's just a tremendous uh, honor to be serving on the board as its uh, president, um, along with uh, wonderful Lisa B. Lewis, who founded it and in the middle of a pandemic, no less, so that took a lot of courage. <laughs> it was a crazy yeah. idea, so of course, we, being circus we folks, doing, being a part of the theater of the impossible, we had to do it, so along with Kip. Um, I serve on the board, um, and I also ringmaster uh, for Omnium Circus as well. So that's omniumcircus.org. dot um, You know, myself, I'm I'm just uh, uh, I'm tr- you know being a husband and uh, running around with my kids who won't stop growing. And uh, I just finished, of course, a wonderful musical out here at the Winter Park Playhouse. Um, I'm actually set to do a cabaret there um, in May, so I'll keep you abreast Fantastic. of that. Um, I'm doing speaking engagements. I have a speaking engagement coming up in March. And, you know, I go to corporations and, you know, run my mouth and they'll give me some money. And uh, I'll do some corporate hosting and things of that nature, some voiceover work as well. So, you know, I'm I'm on the hustle and the grind. And occasionally when I get uh, nervous, I'll probably sell an insurance policy as I have an insurance license. So, <laughs> Well, I, I want to uh, thank all of you for joining us on the call today. And I especially want to thank uh, Denise Payne and Kip Jones, uh, Jonathan Lee Iverson, Vanessa Smith, and also Bernice Collins for uh, joining us here a little bit. Um, really, this has been a wonderful opportunity uh, to get together and talk about the importance of African-American performers and uh, others who have been involved in the circus and, uh, and I thank you all. Jonathan, can you uh, give us the final uh, out? <laughs> Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, and everyone in between, <laughs> may all your days be circus days. <laughs> Amen. You. Awesome. Amen. Uh, we'll Fantastic. See you next uh, month uh, when we have another edition of Circus History Live. Thank you, everyone. Great thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.